Fresh Economic Thinking podcast. New ideas and analysis with Dr. Cameron Murray and Jonathan Gadir. Welcome to another episode of Fresh Economic Thinking. Cameron Murray here. Jonathan Gadir is having a break, but do not worry because we have a special guest this week. Matthew Moltman is with me. He has created a website called One Final Effort, uh, documenting upzoning around the world. And it has become a bit of a global resource in the movement to upzone cities. Uh, I've never met Matt before, so I was very keen to talk to him. Uh, welcome to the show, Matthew Moltman. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, why don't we start um, by perhaps letting you introduce yourself to the listeners. How is it that a, an Aussie economist um, gets this interested in housing policy and and is motivated to start a website like this? What were you hoping to achieve? Yeah, hi. So um, I'm Matthew Botman. I'm currently a research economist at the E61 Institute, which is a nonpartisan uh, think tank. Um so I got interested in housing economics around two years ago. I was working at the Australian Productivity Commission on an inquiry into housing in Australia. And as part of that, I was looking into housing supply. Um, and throughout that process, I became quite fascinated by an emerging literature and uh, evidence base that was coming out of the US as well as New Zealand and other countries, where essentially a lot of places have been talking about for a while the fact that you know, zoning may be a restriction on housing supply. And a few places had finally, you know, uh, gotten onto it and finally have actually made these reforms. And so it was a particularly unique moment, in my opinion, because for a while there's been a lot of debate about whether zoning actually restricts supply and if so, mm-hmm. how it does it and these kinds of things. But to actually have places where you had empirical evidence, new evidence emerging became kind of a, a way to cut through um, some of the debates in the literature. So um, once I left the Productivity Commission, I started a blog, uh, as you mentioned, onefinalefort.com is where it's at. And essentially the aim and objective of that was to uh, firstly document where this was happening, because it was happening across the US as well as New Zealand, as I've mentioned, Canada, I think is about to get in on it. And so play, people didn't really have a resource to be able to go to and say, well, where has it happened? When has it happened? And what, what have the reforms actually been? So just creating that was something that I thought was valuable. But secondly, it was kind of agglomerating, documenting this evidence, because um, you have a very high quality academic literature, which looks at causal effects and things like that, but no one was really documenting just over time what's happening, what's happening to consents, what's happening to rents, what's happening to all these variables. And if there's just a one-stop shop that people can go to and they can look at these effects, it could facilitate more debate and all these kinds of things. So that was the idea behind it. And what's been the response? Um, I, I'm personally very entrenched in these debates, so I see mm-hmm. your website popping up now in all sorts of different places. Has it connected you with people from around the world? What's been the, the the sort of fallout for you personally in terms of your economic connections and and your notability? Yeah, it's been a great response, actually. So it's kind of quite fascinating. So the main way that I've spread it is through my, my Twitter account. And the response has been really interesting insofar as it initially went through the Australian economics, housing economics space and got a, a reasonable response there, facilitated some debate. But over time, it's just kind of finds new ways to penetrate different areas. So then, you know, there's a Californian YIMBY movement where they started to share some of the work that I compiled. And then um, randomly the other week, Poland, a bunch of Polish YIMBY started to go through it and things like that. Obviously, New Zealand being a big part of it, you know, New Zealand academics getting involved. So it's kind of brought together a very broad community um, you know, some journalists have, have gotten around it. I think Matthew Iglesias at one point retweeted some of my work. So it's just been oh, quite wow. fascinating seeing a variety of a variety of people kind of being quite interested in these issues coming from different backgrounds, be it academic or kind of lay people being interested in urban design and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's been great for me. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's been amazing, uh, which is why I thought I should reach out um, because, you know, you're just this... Uh, I guess, like me, in many ways, this Aussie economist mm. start blogging and and sort of things go around the world uh, mm. with with social media these days. So maybe it's we should talk about the sort of um, the theoretical and it sort of empirical debate that that you mentioned just before. You sort of said there was this debate going on, and then finally we had uh, these case studies to look at in reality. Talk mm. me through what's the 
what's the main argument here and and what's the controversy about upzoning and you know what's what's it trying to achieve yeah so it's been quite fascinating as i mentioned and even up until very recently you have uh two sides of the debate i suppose you've got the the yimby side kind of encapsulating a broader them which includes academic economists and things like that as well and then i don't know if this is a Drawbridge term, but some people refer to them as left NIMBYs or people who are very skeptical about market rate housing. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm. I think I'm one of them. I'm skeptical of how much the property market can do for, mm. for example, tenants. But we, you know, we'll get onto that. I, I want to sure sort of um, get onto your view. So there's the mm. uh, the YIMBYs and these left NIMBYs. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's a term that people like being referred to, but I don't really have another term for them. Mm. Um, But yeah, for for quite a while, it was a debate about complex methodologies and econometric methodologies. So I'm sure I know you've done some work Mm -hmm. on the glazer Geico methodology and things like Mm -hmm. that. Then you have these very high level case studies. So people talk about like Tokyo and Houston and things like this. So um, it was a debate which um, didn't really have a cut through, like both sides were quite entrenched. Mm -hmm. And so what we've had over the past decade essentially was a bunch of places have relaxed um, their zoning restrictions and so from a, a kind of neoclassical economist's frame view framework that would relax the restrictions on supply which would shift supply to the right and make it more elastic which would lower house prices and make them more affordable and lower rents and make them more affordable so that was mm-hmm. kind of the theoretical framework that some people believed whereas other people mm-hmm. believed that market rate housing wouldn't um, market rate housing wouldn't affect affordability either at the lower end of the market or Mm. um things like that um very simplifying positions here but essentially Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. what uh i started to look at and what a bunch of academic economists have looked at is okay well we have auckland which is up zone three quarters of suburban land what is the impact of that being both from a cause perspective and kind of more of an inferential empirical perspective so just documenting a lot of these things so relying quite heavily on that empirical literature rather than trying to make well, in theory, this should occur or whatever. It's it's actually looking at what actually did occur and then we can have debates about that impact opposed to speculating, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's funny you say that because um, my position is obviously sceptical of, of mm-hmm. what we end up achieving. And I guess I'll come back to what, I, what you think is the best metric of success. Um, uh, so... Uh, I've been very supportive of upzoning in general, very cautious that in practice that means sort of giving away a lot of value to the existing private property owners in the process. So my background is uh, working for property developers and working in planning in the government. And uh, yeah, so a lot of the game in property development is, is sort of getting buying land zoned at one use and getting it upzoned, right, for a freebie because mm-hmm. it's much, much easier to invest in changing the rules than invest in building houses <laughs> so mm. so that's always in the back of my mind and probably explains my my caution mm-hmm. uh, about it all um so we we i've still though been supportive of just doing the experiment and so we've done it in new zealand or well, new zealand's done essentially the best that anyone has proposed mm-hmm. as far as i can see uh and that was in 2016 can you maybe just um, talk us through what happened in Auckland and uh, in terms of the upzoning and what you've documented on your website uh, about the fallout from that, because it's been essentially closing in on seven years um, mm. since that decision. So there's there's plenty to to see. Yeah, absolutely. So Auckland's kind of the best case example in terms of it was a very broad, broad and sweeping reform. It was a reform where the city, the city government of Auckland upzoned three quarters of the suburban land. So it was very broad. And I suppose that's something that's been very good for the debate because when we've had a lot of upzonings or rezonings in the past, they've been very small scale or piecewise, or like you just mentioned, potentially a, a particular developer lobbying or what have you. This was a very broad scale reform. Um, and so there's been both sophisticated econometric work out of um, Ryan Greenway McGrevy out of the University of Auckland, which found that there was a causal effect of this policy on housing supply and um, increased zoning, um, increased supply in the upzoned areas and increased supply of uh, multi-unit housing. But what I've also been documenting on my website is just looking at, okay, each month what's happening to dwelling consents? Are they still going up or are they still going down? And they're still going up. And so essentially we've had this pretty large increase in 
uh, dwelling supply in Auckland post uh, upzoning. Mm -hmm. So it's been increased by uh, quite a significant percent. And also the compositions increased significantly. So before it was just under half multi-unit housing, and now it's about three quarters, I believe. Um, the other thing I've been documenting is the impact on, on rents. And this is the finding that a lot of people have been very interested in is that We've seen that real rents have fallen in Auckland post this reform, whereas in the rest of New Zealand, they've been up by over about 10%, and in Wellington, they're up by over, uh, I think, 15%. So it's something that has seen a lower, uh, sorry, reduction in, in real rents. There's a question as to whether that's directly due to the upzoning or whether that's you know due to other factors as well, potentially. Um, rent income ratios have, have also fallen um, significantly, whereas in the rest of the country, they've risen. Um, and finally, the other thing I've documented is that these policies have been quite popular. So uh, plurality of Aucklanders approve of these changes. Um, and so it's something that has had a good response there as well. So I've been broadly documenting those impacts in Auckland. Yeah, that's one of the interesting um, ones also I find is that, um, you know, there's a sort of policy debate and there's this YIMBY versus NIMBY idea that locals don't want you know, change in their area. And that's sort of always been the case. I don't think that's a a modern phenomena. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm sure I could go back a thousand years <laughs> into ancient Egypt and find someone complaining about what their neighbor's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, that's, that's quite interesting that it's, it's broadly popular in New Zealand. And I think that's um, sort of coincides with your effort as well as raising awareness from it as saying, hey, they did it. It's fine. It's not unpopular. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you try it as well? And we can we can know more. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's super interesting. Um, one of the um one of the uh puzzles though with property is uh, sort of I mean it's always the case in macroeconomics, understanding causal effects and mm-hmm. um you know, which is why sort of more experiments on the ground are worth doing. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you reconcile the sort of um, troubles with understanding, is this just a normal part of the cycle? Uh, you know, did we upzone because there was a boom and hence we're now uh, doing that? Like we're, we're sort of just measuring the fact that we're in a construction boom. So mm. what makes me think, you know, that's at least some part of the story is in Sydney, you know, rents fell from 2017 to 2021 also, mm. right? So um, so that's why I'm very cautious about you know, maybe this is a great policy for urban design. Mm. And I, my line is always, well, um, upzone the areas you want to develop and don't do the ones you don't. Like do it for city design reasons um, and then let the market, you know, do its best within those constraints. Um What's the sort of response been um, in terms of that sort of, well, you know, rents went down in Sydney or, yeah, there's just a spatial uh, substitution from the um, the non-up zone to the up zoned areas. For example, mm. Brian McGree's paper. Well, it's always the case if you up zone the left side of the street compared to the right, that when you then measure the rate of supply the period after, it's probably going to be more shifted to the up zone side of the street. It's not clear mm. what the total is. What's your sort of response to that? Do you um, see there being good methods for addressing it or better case studies that could put this to bed? Yeah, so there's a couple of things to un- unpack there. Um, I'll kind of break them down, I suppose. So the first mm-hmm. thing is that when I'm looking at rents and saying, well, real rents fell in Auckland over this period, I'm not claiming that that's a direct caused by mm-hmm. the upzoning policy. It's been interesting that some people... To make that claim um, within the EMB movement, and that's not something that that I would support. I would support saying, well, this seems to be having an effect on rents, and we can maybe debate whether there are other impacts. It's very, very tricky to look at causal effects on on rents because when you increase housing supply in a particular area, it encourages people to move there, which increases demand and all of these kinds of things. So it's very tricky to find an appropriate counterfactual. That's 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 the first thing. The second thing is that on the Greenaway McGrevy paper, which is the one that I rely on reasonably heavily to make more causal claims here on supply, um, they simulate kind of a, a counterfactual, which is what dwelling supply would have looked like in the absence of the policy. So it's not just as simple as saying, well, dwelling consents went up in upzoned areas and they and they went down or stayed about the same in non-upzoned areas. Yeah. They do have a more sophisticated methodology. Now, you can still believe that methodology or not believe that methodology, and that's academic economics for you but um i think it's it's reasonably 
compelling. Um, the third thing is that particularly what's interesting about this movement globally to upzone a variety of jurisdictions is now we're getting emerging evidence, not just out of Auckland, but out of other places as well. So there's a variety of other papers that I do have access and links to on my website. Um, so there's a, a paper by an academic called Dong out of Portland, which found that upzoning there increased um, supply, it increased development on upzone parcels. Um, there's a paper by Buckler and Lutz out of uh, Switzerland, um, Zurich, which also finds the same thing. Um, and then there was a paper recently that came out, I believe, this week by an academic called Stacey and as well as Freemark, which um, oh, yeah. looked at kind of uh, upzonings around the US or policy reforms around the US and found that that also had a correlation to increased supply. But I would really like to see a big movement out of, you know, there's upzoning now in Minneapolis, there's upzonings now in North Carolina and places like this. I would really like to see a lot of new literature here to really cement the robustness of this finding. I think that's a great opportunity for this debate to be furthered still. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the more that these changes happen on the ground, and mm. I actually, um, to be honest, I sort of see in the background not just the sort of um, housing market affordability element to upzoning, but in the background an urban design, mm. getting people comfortable with consolidation, mm -hmm. a change in tastes and preferences, you might call it as an economist. I see, I see that effort as quite productive in general. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I, was the vice president of my local community group. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting to see when we'd go out and talk to young people, they're like, yeah, whatever, do this. I'm like, I, I moved here now because I like the more cosmopolitan lifestyle and I'm comfortable that things change. Whereas the mm -hmm. older groups are like, well, I moved here because it was all detached houses and it was a secret quiet pocket. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the movement is, is, possibly just getting people more comfortable that, hey, cities are going to change. Um, yeah, let, you, know, you can argue that you know, we need infrastructure upgrades or this and that, and mm -hmm. that's that's one of the debates that sort of gets left to the side on this up zone, don't up zone, is that a lot of the times we're trying to coordinate the fact we don't want to expand on all fronts at the same time because that means we have to expand every single road, every single sewer, mm -hmm. every... You know what I mean? And if we could concentrate that in certain areas with planning, uh, you can you can improve overall efficiency. So that's sort of also something that's by the by. But uh, I think we're definitely on board uh, with the experimentation element mm. that, you know, it's it's super useful. So I guess one of the other questions is, um, you know, my uh, my background is somewhat political. Uh, I wrote mm -hmm. a book about great corruption in Australia and so one of the um, political contradictions I see in this debate um, is that uh, the property industry lobbies to upzone, right? They lobby to, for mass upzoning, spot upzoning, you name it. Uh, and the logic is, well, this is going to lower rents for household renters. Yet we see whenever we try and lower rents with other types of policies, for example, in Queensland this week, we proposed a, a limit on how quickly you could raise the rent on a sitting tenant. Within hours, the property lobby is out there saying, you can't do that, you can't do that. You know, low rents are bad. And yet at the same time, the same lobby is saying, no, upzone us because that will lower rents, right? So so how do you reconcile the, the po politics of this that... That developers love up zoning, landlords love it. There's 18 million landlords in Australia. Predominantly, they're not going to redevelop. They're just going to lose rents if, if that's the case. How do you reconcile that sort of political tension? Yeah, well, a couple of things. I don't rely very heavily on um, what people lobby for as as evidence of um, what might happen. Okay. That's that's just not. I don't find that particularly compelling evidence. There's also a, a quantity dimension as well as the price dimension. So if I'm a developer, maybe upzoning will on net lower housing prices across the master market relative to what they would have otherwise done. But mm -hmm. I might be able to build and sell 10% more housing. So there is that that trade-off there. So I think that you know there is a political economy element to it. Um mm -hmm. I don't I don't really see what the so the implication you're implying would be that uh this actually won't lower rents. Um, I think that it probably won't, as in developers believe it won't lower rents. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. At least they don't believe it. And whether yeah. over time that sort of washes out and they don't really understand the true equilibrium effects, um, would would you, yeah, 
That's what I mean. Yeah. What yeah. I mean. Okay. So I, that's, I think that's an interesting point. I, I think that the difference between something like rent control and upzoning is that rent control is a very fixed effect insofar as it, it necessarily limits what you can do. Whereas upzoning, you still have normal market cycles. So there might be a particular type market cycle and rents might rise significantly over that market cycle. And that still has the capacity for landlords to make a, a higher return there. Um, and then you might have a lower market uh, market cycle where rental markets are a bit looser and then there's lower returns. So rent mm-hmm. control as a mechanism is a bit more set in stone in terms of what the impacts would be and it necessarily will always guarantee some degree of lower rents if it's if it's binding. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas upzoning still has that capacity to have those kind of natural fluctuations in which prices can respond to you know vacancies and things like this. Um, mm-hmm. So that might be a potential impact of it as well. I think also the evidence that you've seen out of Auckland now, it's not that rents have completely crashed, for example, in um, Auckland. They've just risen more slowly than they have in the rest of the country and then CPI and incomes over time rise as well. So it, it, it likely is a, is a shorter, ter- uh, sorry, a longer term uh, kind of effect that kind of takes place yeah. over time opposed to rent control, which might have an impact next year for developers and things, or landlords rather, and things like that. Yeah, so that's right. So uh, I guess it's 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 quite timely because I live in Queensland and we've just had this weird political thing where on Monday morning the Premier said nothing's off the table, uh, even capping how fast you can increase rents, and then the whole week's mm-hmm. been this crazy political debate and, and I uh, kind of expect them to backtrack. So I just thought uh, it was also timely to put that out there. And mm-hmm. I'm also interested in your views. So um, up zoning, you know, I think my um, my position is more if you do it for city design outcomes, do that. But it's really it's not going to get you radically affordable housing. Still, the bottom third of renter households are going to be squeezed. Um, you know, there might be a different composition of what sort of dwellings they could live in. Uh, so I think I want to know from you, you've now had this interest, you're now the the, the world website expert on, on these case <laughs> studies, and, and it's a very interesting thing. But I, I'm, I'm also interested in your thoughts on other types of housing policies, because in Australia in particular, we had the Falinski inquiry last year, we had just recently announced this housing affordability fund. Uh, mm-hmm. We always talk about stamp duty and negative gearing and first home buyers grants and all sorts of things. So maybe we can do a quick like tick box of what what's Matthew Maltman's quick quick view or opinion on a policy. So you, rent caps, mm-hmm. we you know, do you have any final when I say rent caps, I just mean a limit on how quickly you can increase rents on a sitting tenant, not a sort of old mm. style New York. This is this dwelling is associated with this price forever. Uh, your quick view on limiting the rate of increase in rent. Uh, on net, I'm not a fan, but I think they can be designed in a way where they're not super perverse. So if you, I think there's a way that you can do them, that if you're going to do them, that it's not going to completely destroy everything else in the market. But on net, I'm not a fan. Okay. What about the Housing Affordability Fund, um, which was what is currently being considered in the Senate, which is to put $10 billion into some kind of financial fund and spend the profits on some unspecified things? Your your quick take. Very quick take. I'm not an expert on this particular area, so I might be completely wrong, uh-huh. but on that, again, I'm not a fan. I think that your position of just why don't we just build the houses makes more sense, but I'm not particularly educated on that particular effort. Um, that particular issue. So maybe there are other things I haven't considered. Okay. The the Aussie classic first home buyer grants. Uh, not a fan. No. Not a fan. And no. the basic reason why? Um, I, they push up probably property prices. And I think that that income, that, that expenditure could go towards more vulnerable people, including renters and things like that. Okay. So- Swapping stamp duty for land tax. So stamp duty is a tax you pay, a buyer pays when they buy a property, like a few percent of the purchase price. And a land tax is essentially a a tax on the percentage of land value that you pay every year when you own property. And it's been a popular policy to swap them. Mm. What's your view? Yeah, again, this isn't one I'm I'm a massive expert on, but on net, yeah, I'm a a fan. Uh, I'm not a unbelievably well educated on this particular area but yes i think there are efficiency and equity benefits potentially here 
Interesting. What about negative gearing and capital gains tax? That's another popular one in Australia. Um, mm. Everyone thinks that uh, the competition from investor buyers because they can um, deduct uh, real or sort of accounting losses against their other income. Uh, there was a debate a couple of years ago, ago about forcing owners of residential property to quarantine accounting losses against future income from that property. Your your view on that as an um, idea? Of negative gearing and capital gains tax? Yeah, as in reducing the capital gains tax exemption, so we mm. get a 50% discount yeah. in Australia from that, and or quarantining um, losses from negative gearing against just the future um, gains from that particular property. Yeah, I, I'd probably be a fan of that. I'm not... Um, I think these are capital gains tax and negative gearing are kind of overblown in the discourse. People act like they are mm. the biggest factor relating to house prices. I think on net changes to them to um, make them less significant would be would be positive, but I don't think it gets the appropriate amount of... It gets too much airtime. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I Well, we're going to totally agree that that's overblown. Uh, that's also my view. <laughs> but it's funny that in, um, in the press... Um, it doesn't really seem to matter. Um, they, they make good headlines. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts on substantially expanding public housing, that's government-owned housing, either for lease at a very discounted rate or for sale at a, you know, to, to tenants over time at a very discounted rate. Are we including community housing in here or is this specifically public housing? Just, just public, run by the states, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd probably be a, be a fan of increasing it. The degree to which... We increase it is a kind of complicated question that I don't think anyone has a particularly good answer to. But it's actually quite interesting that a lot of people within the YIMBY movement are fans of public housing and social housing. And people like Greater Canberra do go to things like community consultations in order to advocate for more social housing and um, public mm -hmm. housing. So that's kind of a, a alliance that I think can be formed and should be relied upon a bit more. Yeah, interesting. Okay couple more rent assistance so we basically pay low-income renters cash in their bank because they're low income and they rent uh, and i know grattan institutes come out a few times and said we need to expand rent assistance do you support that view um yes i, I would support increasing rent assistance um tying it not to cpi but to um cpi for rents or particularly rental growth but i also think there's a way that you can reform it to make it uh, more efficient and more equitable, even if you didn't increase rent assistance. So I think without spending any more money, you can make it a significantly better policy. In in what way? What are you hinting at there? So rent assistance is a function of several variables. It's a function of how much rent a tenant pays, and there are different categories. So if you're a single household, if you're a, a mm -hmm. family household, et cetera, those criteria in terms of how much CRA you receive haven't been reviewed properly in 20 plus years. So you could tweak those criteria to make it so that it could be redistributed in a way where more vulnerable households receive more CRA and less vulnerable households receive less even without spending any more money. But I think you should probably also spend more money as well. Very interesting. Um, that seems quite, <laughs> quite reasonable to me. So mm -hmm. one of the last things I want to ask you about, um, a lot of the talk at the moment is about you know the immigration floodgates in Australia. And I uh, put out a tweet the other day saying, isn't it funny that uh, property, the property development lobby says we've got a housing shortage, but we should definitely just keep jacking up immigration. Uh, do you have a view on on that or whether that's a contradiction or how do you, where do you stand on that debate? Um, I, I don't really particularly care what the housing lobbyists say. Um, I think building more housing is probably a good thing and more immigration is also a good thing. I think like if your if your point is that the housing lobby and developers would like more immigration because it would mean that in the long run there's more demand for housing, that's probably true. But I think that from a public policy point of view, immigration brings a variety of valid benefits. So we should find ways to ensure that we can take in as many migrants as we can. Um, and building more housing has a lot of other pub, uh, a lot of other benefits. So I think we should try and do both of those things. Very interesting. So I, I want to, you know, we're not Joe Rogan, as I say here, we don't do four hour podcasts, we mm -hmm. we get someone on, get their key insights. Um, in terms of where we started with this whole story on 
upzoning and the case studies. Mm-hmm. Where is the politics progress? What what's coming down the pipeline? Are you following um, different cities or different countries where you're expecting new experiments to arise? Where should I and my listeners um, be on the lookout for the next case study? Yeah, so I have a, an upzoning tracker on my website, and I also maintain as a public Excel spreadsheet on or Google Sheet on my Twitter. And so there I'm tracking where these things are occurring. Um, and it's actually going to be really fascinating because in 2020, 2021, 2022, particularly in America, there were several cities that did upzone. So like Rayleigh, North Carolina is one. There's been a bunch of reforms in California. And so we're going to start to see some of the impacts of these policies over the next year or two. So we'll have not just Auckland and Minneapolis and Portland, but we'll have a variety of responses. So that's something to keep a particular eye on. So if you're interested in that, that's a place you can go is on my, my blog or my Twitter account. Um, but in Australia specifically, we mm. don't have much in terms of policy experiments in the pipeline. So that's something as well that I'm pushing for is that uh, all it takes is one government here to really adopt these things and run with them, see what happens. We'll have a bunch of new evidence to move forward the debate. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Where do you think uh, would be the ideal, if you were in charge, what what would you do to uh, design a policy experiment? Would you just cut Sydney in half or <laughs> would you would you do Sydney, or not Melbourne, or would you do half of multiple cities? Uh, what do you think in Australia is the mm. best sort of um, bang for your buck sort of upzoning we should be looking at first? I think Canberra actually might be a good place to have a look at for a variety of reasons. Obviously, they mm-hmm. don't have local governments in the same way that other states do there. Uh, there's a growing GIMBY movement there. So I've already mentioned Greater Canberra, who I think do great work. Um, something like 83% of the land there is zoned for um, low density. And there was a, an article in the ABC, I think last year, which looked at, well, what would happen in terms of the capacity for development if we move towards an Auckland-style system there? Rents are very high in Canberra as well, so um, that's something that could have potentially an impact on on rents, so there might be a political reason to do that there as well. So that might be a good place to start, but if any if any state or, or local government wanted to take this up, I think that's something that we could all get on board with and have a look at what would happen. Yeah, it's very interesting because um, the ACT is this kind of little Australian uh, experimental zone with its mm. uh, one territory government, no... Um, councils um they did the stamp duty for land tax Mm. swap that they've been doing um they also charge uh, a value capture fee from upzoning so you'd think that would um make them a lot more comfortable Mm. uh, doing further densification knowing that it's you know it's going to self-fund a little bit the the infrastructure upgrades it might need so that makes uh total sense to me matthew is there anything you think listeners of this podcast should know about housing. Uh, is there any great big myth out there that you think uh, sh- should be debunked or is there, are there any last messages you would have? Um, not, not massively in terms of, of great big myths. I would say that in general, um, people should look at the empirical evidence and, and be very careful about making causal claims. Um, the closest thing to a big myth I'd say is, is when you're looking at demographic data you know, don't just compare population growth to, to dwelling stock growth. That's one that I seem to come up with or people come up with a variety of times. So that might be one to, to think about. But no, other than that, not really. So uh, what's the comparing population growth to housing growth? What's the, what the explain that for our listeners? Because I don't so, think anyone. Yeah, so a, var- so a variety of people will go something like, well, we built, let's say five, we increased dwelling stock by 5%, but population only grew by 4% or something mm-hmm. like that. And they go, well, therefore we've built, lots of housing and therefore we should have expected rents and prices to fall. The problem with that argument is that it doesn't account for broader demographic trends. So there's been a broad demographic trend within Australia for popular household size to fall. So we saw this particularly during the COVID pandemic as well, where the average household size fell as people wanted more space and things like that. And so you have to account for these underlying trends in our population when you're looking at what's the comparison between population and demographics. So if you simply go, well, we've got more houses than people, um, that's not accounting for what people want to be occupying those houses, how many people want to be occupying those houses and things like that. That's that's right. So I, I've written similar things that demographics uh, and the ch- aging population, for example, if you compare Australia to Japan or Greece or somewhere, mm. um, 
you know, that's that's not really painting the full picture. You need to look more at the distribution of households and, and the, the, the smaller sample of households that are potential buyers or the new households, uh, which is where all the action is in the market. Look, Matthew, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, it's onefinaleffort.com. Is that right? Or is there a .au? That's just .com. And my Twitter account is uh, one final effort with a one, the number one, and then final effort. So you can also follow me there if you're interested. Um, if it's okay, I just want to quick shout out to my mate, Brad, uh, who I used to live with. We used to discuss your work a, a fair bit, actually, when we used to live together. So I'm sure he's <laughs> So just say hello to him. If that's all right. Well, g'day, Brad. Look, Matt, very interesting conversation. Um, look, although, um, you know, in terms of categorizing ours, us, I'd say I'm more of the left NIMBY and you're a YIMBY, but at the end of the day, <laughs> I don't think any of that really matters because we're both there like, ready to experiment and, and do the experiments and see what happens. Mm. And gee, if only more people had uh, that attitude, I think we'd learn a lot more about how to make the world better by just trying. Um, mm. So really appreciate your time and what you're doing to help inform everyone of, of what's going on. Best of luck no to you. Thank you.